spoke very well of the, all the worries that come with this time of year as we get into the holiday season with Christmas and that other holiday that comes before it. I think it's called Black Friday Eve <laughs> or Thanksgiving. As you are struggling to make sure everything is ready this year, I have some words of wisdom for you. In every life, there comes some trouble. When you worry, you make it double. Don't worry. Be happy. <laughs> I'd say more, but I'm worried about musical copyright laws. <laughs> that song came out uh, my internship year. I was just finishing seminary, and um, it was kind of like a, a, a ray of light at that time, uh, which maybe you need your last year in seminary. It was such a happy song. It was so simple, and yet so, so, it, it just raised my spirits. And part of it, I think, is Bobby McFerrin, who has this amazing and, as far as I know, completely unique vocal talent. And part of it was the video. He and Robin Williams and a third person who I don't remember who that is, uh, was playing and, and just the joy exuded from them. And it was really nice. Don't worry. Be happy. That um, sentiment is really nice. Although maybe not always terribly practical. I mean, when you're worried, it's usually because you have something to worry about. And just saying, don't worry, be happy, well, maybe that doesn't address the situation as well as it might. And, that, and that's, that's kind of how I felt sometimes in my life about the scripture we, uh, that Carolyn read just a few minutes ago. Jesus is talking to his disciples and he says, don't worry. Don't worry about what you're going to wear and what you're going to eat. God cares for the, the flowers and the birds, doesn't he? God will care for you. Which is nice, but how do you apply it to your life? I mean, we aren't too worried about what to wear or what to eat. I mean, this week, this morning, we wear uh, Sunday morning casual. This week, we will eat turkey. We're not worried about that so much. Maybe we're worried about having enough, although usually at Thanksgiving, you've got enough and leftovers. Maybe we're worried about inviting someone to Thanksgiving who uh, has a restricted diet for some reason. Mostly, though, we're, we're not terribly worried about those things. We worry, we worry about bigger things. We worry about fires. This has been one of the worst seasons, possibly the worst fire season in California. And we worry about the people who've lost their homes. We worry about what's going to happen next year. We worry about how we can plan to prevent or at least be able to respond to things like this better because it looks like it's going to get worse. We worry about shootings. We worry because several weeks ago there was a gunman who went into a synagogue in, Pits in Pennsylvania and killed a number of people. And that same day there was a, a man who went into a grocery store and shot several elderly African-American people. And since then, we've had the shooting at the nightclub here in our own area. We worry about our friends and our family and our, our children. We worry because it doesn't seem like any place is safe because this happens at nightclubs and concerts and houses of worship and schools and any place you can think of. We worry because we're not sure what to do about it and we want to make sure we're safe. People of Hawaii had a big worry this summer. There was a broadcast that went out 
that said there are missiles incoming from North Korea. Please take shelter. This is not a drill. It was a drill. And it was kind of an embarrassing mistake that they, uh, well, embarrassing for some, terrifying for others, that, they, that it, the message went out that way. And it made us a little more aware of how many people there are out there with powerful weapons who aren't our friends. We worry. And when somebody says, don't worry, be happy, we can say that's unrealistic. And even when Jesus says, don't worry, you of little faith, we can say, little faith. Get real, Jesus. Maybe, maybe when everything is going well and we're happy and, and prosperous and well-fed and, and, and we know that no one can threaten us or harm us, maybe then we can say, don't worry, be happy. But right now, we've got a lot of real things to worry about, so none of this pie-in-the-sky stuff from you. Except when we think about it, it really wasn't pie in the sky. People in Jesus' time had to deal with a lot of stuff. And when you think about it, more stuff than we do. They lived in the Roman Empire, and that was during a time of what was called the Pax Romana, the Roman peace, where Rome was so strong that very few people dared challenge them, although it did happen sometimes, and they were defeated sometimes, and there was internal turmoil a lot of the time. We think we've got political chaos and division in our country right now. Well, in Rome, in the early empire, the period that Jesus and the disciples lived through, there was, it was worse. There was very bad internal politics to the degree that the way you became emperor was often by poisoning the last emperor or by raising an army and, and fighting the last emperor and his army. In fact, that got so bad that there was one year that's known in history as the year of the three emperors. Three guys tried. One finally held on. No. People in Jesus' time, believers in Jesus' message, largely thought they were living in the last days. And when you look at the things that were going on, we looked at some of these in the Revelation class that recently ended. There was a volcano that erupted, Mount Vesuvius, that looked like the end of the world. It darkened skies across the whole empire, destroyed two of their most popular cities. There were foreigners, the Parthians, who had defeated a Roman army, and the Romans were just sure that they were going to come and, and, and run over the empire and sack and pillage and plunder. They weren't because they had their own internal politics that were really bad. They had to deal with that. But there was a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety, a lot of worry. So no, Jesus wasn't preaching some sort of pie-in-the-sky idea, an idea that you don't need to worry because God will keep anything bad from touching you or your family or your friends or your country or your community. You're perfectly safe and protected. I don't think he was saying that at all. I think what he was doing was he was teaching people an attitude to replace the attitude that we often fall into. I've heard it called an attitude of scarcity, where we measure life by the things we don't have. We've got food. Do we have enough food? Well, we've got more food than we could ever eat. But if we have immigrants or refugees or poor people, maybe we don't have enough food to share with them. Maybe it's better to keep it for ourselves. Maybe we don't have enough technology to keep us safe and secure. Maybe we don't have enough weapons. Maybe we don't have enough trust. Maybe we don't have enough confidence. Maybe we, we, 
even though in this country we are the strongest and richest country, maybe we don't have enough stuff to really feel secure in that. Maybe what we need to do is protect what we have and shut everyone else out. And the problem with the attitude of scarcity is that uh, it's driven by fear. The fear may be somewhat realistic. I mean, there are people who have been shot in schools. It's, a, it's actually a fairly small number. It's, it's, uh, it's less than, it's, it's way, way down on the, on the causes of death list. Um, which is not to say it's not serious and doesn't need to be dealt with. But it's not as all pervasive as we sometimes imagine. So sometimes our fears are realistic, and sometimes our fears are exaggerated, and sometimes our fears are non-existent. We fear things that are not a threat, that are never going to be a threat. And that can be anything from the... Uh, a caravan of people seeking to ask for refuge in the United States, coming from Honduras, who we've, we've, we've heard bizarre things about. They've been infiltrated by terrorists. They're, they're, uh, there are dangerous gangs in there, um, and things like that. When people actually go to check out the facts, though, uh, like I read the blog of a pastor who went down to walk with the people of the caravan, and what he saw were mostly women and children leaving a bad situation, trying to find a better one. Sometimes our fears can be even less substantial than that. Did you know that our government is not controlled by our elected leaders? Because our, electric, our elected leaders are being controlled by mind control rays used by the lizard people who live in the core of the world. <laughs> you may not believe this is a real conspiracy theory, but it is. I s there are videos on YouTube proving that President Obama is one of the lizard people because when you look very close at his haircut, when he cuts his hair short, you can see the image of a reptilian face. <laughs> people believe a lot of things because we live in a world of uncertainties and so we want to make certainties. If a conspiracy will explain things, we'll latch on to a conspiracy. If a bizarre theory makes things make more sense and makes us feel like we've got more control and makes us feel more secure as a result, we may very well abandon logic and follow that strange message. Worse than that, when our fears, as they often do, get attached to a group of people, migrants, refugees, people of a different race or ethnicity, people of a different gender or sexuality than us, people coming from another country, people who look or act or think differently than we do, people on the other side of the political spectrum, it becomes easy to dehumanize those people. To think of them not as people anymore, but as a threat. And when you start thinking of people not as people, but as a threat, it becomes really easy to justify doing horrible things to them. That's the mindset of scarcity. It's okay if bad things happen out there because I need to protect myself. I need to guard my resources. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. But Jesus offers a different, an alternative vision to that. Don't worry. That's not to say don't be concerned about... about things that might happen to you. It's not saying go out in traffic and release the steering wheel and say, I trust God to get me home. 
No, you could still do sensible things. Still find ways to uh, guard yourself against danger and disease and, and all the things that can impact our lives. But don't let the fear get out of control to where it's not us making the decision anymore, but our fears making the decision. Instead of fear, make decisions based on God's values. Make decisions based on compassion when we see someone in need. Make decisions based on justice when we see someone who is powerless and threatened. Make decisions based on mercy. Even though the person you show mercy to or forgiveness to may not understand it, may not appreciate it, and may never be able to offer you anything in return, do it because... That's the way we think when we're part of what Jesus called the kingdom of heaven. See, Jesus, when he says, don't worry, he doesn't just leave it there. He said, seek you first the kingdom of God and God's righteousness. And all these other things, they'll all fall into place. It's not saying, as I said, that's not saying you won't ever get sick. It's not saying you won't ever be mugged. It's not saying your country won't ever have an economic crisis or go to war. But it is saying you don't have to be a slave to the fear of those things. No matter what the threats are out there, you have a choice not to worry, but to trust in God and to follow the values of God's kingdom. And when you do, and when you reach out to, to embrace the stranger, to welcome the refugee, to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to, to house the poor, when you do that, amazing things happen. You can't meet everyone's needs all the time, but when you go forth and say, hey, I've only got a few pieces of bread and a couple of fish, but I'm going to share it with all of you folks. Amazing things can happen. Things that will never happen when we block everyone out and think in the, uh, in the mindset of scarcity. One of my professors called the way Jesus calls us to think is the mindset of abundance or the mindset of thanksgiv thanksgiving because God, God's grace is so much bigger than all our needs. God's blessings fill the world and beyond. When we remember that and focus on that, then we're not thinking about all the things we can't do anymore because that can paralyze you. We're thinking about all the things with God's help we can do and should do. And it gives us the courage to take that step and to try. Live thankfully. This is how the church came out of its dangerous shaky early beginnings to become the widest spread and largest religion in the world. This is how Christianity has changed so many lives. This is how we, ordinary people, can continue to change the world. Don't worry. Be thankful.